Welcome to WeChat Divorce. Today, Catherine and I welcome Leanne Townsend, a family law attorney in Toronto. Welcome, Leanne. Thank you. It's nice to be here. So today, our episode is called The Struggle of Dealing with a Coercive Spouse. In this episode, we're going to dive into the challenges of managing emotions and finances when dealing with a coercive spouse. But first, let's meet Leanne. Leanne, as I said, is a family law attorney in Toronto. She's the founder of Townsend Family Law, where her practice is focused on family law, domestic violence, and victim advocacy. Prior to founding her own firm, Leanne gained significant experience both as a partner at a respected Bay Street law firm, as well as over 16 years as, as an assistant crown attorney, most of which was spent as the domestic violence co-lead in that office. Leanne has spoken at a variety of events, and you also host the Divorcing Well podcast, as well as a co-host of the Divorce Explained podcast. And I have here your biggest pride and joy are your ch two children. Um, welcome again. Thank you. Happy to be here. We're so happy to have you. We're looking forward to our discussion for sure. But first, Leanne, can you just share with our audience uh, a little bit about your story and how you ended up where you are today doing your great work? Yeah, it's been a little bit of a journey. Um, I started my career, uh, as you mentioned, as a prosecutor. Uh, so, you know, here in Canada, we call them crown attorneys. In the U.S., it's district attorneys. So I spent the first, um, you know, se maybe 17 years of my career a as a prosecutor. And I specialized in domestic violence and, as you mentioned, became the co-lead in um, the Toronto West Crown's office uh, for domestic violence. And I just naturally gravitated, I guess, to that area. Part of it um, was just an interest in, in helping victims of domestic violence. Um, and part of it was I myself have been in uh, an abusive relationship at one point in time. And um, you know, not, not a physically abusive one, but other types of abuse. And so I related on some level as well to the victims and why they stay and, uh, how you can be, you know, smart and educated and outwardly seemingly have a lot of things going for you, but you can find yourself in a relationship like that. So I, I very much related to that. Um, and when I left the, the crown's office and decided I wanted to have other, you know, challenges in my life and do other things, um, I went into family law. It was another area that had always interested me. And then there was just a natural overlap between, um, you know, what I'd been doing as a crown with the domestic violence and family law, because obviously there's lots of families where there's domestic violence and course of control. And so it, it was a natural niche for me to develop in my practice. And so while I do take on all, a full range of family law cases and all types of cases, um, I have had a particular you know, focus in that area in my practice. And uh, I still find it something that I'm passionate about helping, you know, I say women, but there are men who are, are victims too, but it, it does tend to be more women. Um, who I've worked with. And uh, I, I find that the family law system has its challenges uh, with helping them, but I'm there to do the best I can. It's a great specialty to have, because even if you don't feel like you have a narcissistic spouse, somebody's usually controlling the finances, right? And to be able to go to an attorney who in turn can help you advocate for yourself to me, I think would make such a huge difference. You know, we like to empower everyone by getting the financial knowledge that they need so that they can talk to their attorney or work with an attorney who understands that it's a little bit more complex when you feel so controlled by your spouse. Because we so often see attorneys who are not equipped to deal with that, who end up bullying their own clients into just agreeing to something to get them to an agreement. I don't think they can handle it. Up, um, um, actually. Yeah, I, you know, I can see, I, like, I've worked with people who, you know, had previous attorneys before finding me, who had that experience where they felt uh, intimidated, or almost bullied by their own lawyer who, you know, is supposed to be there to to protect them and to help them. And, I, you know, I do think um, 
both the the bar and the judiciary you know need more education sometimes in dealing with victims of domestic violence there there have been steps you know done there has been some progress from how it was you know, certainly 20 years ago and maybe even 10 years ago, but there's still work to be done because, you know, and I think that's what helped me is because I had been in that type of situation myself, I relate it to, uh, you know, I relate to my clients on that level and um, can, and I, you know, just through my own personal journey, learned a lot of tools and, you know, filled my toolbox with different things that I could do to help myself move forward and heal. And so I'm able to bring those to my clients as well. I love hearing this because it's just a daily conversation we have with so many people. And I always say, how do the attorneys get away with this, you know, behavior? Um, So I love a niche market or a specialty where you really have that personal experience, but you have the smarts behind you to help them advocate for themselves. Because at the end of the day, they do have to advocate for themselves to some level, um, even post-divorce. So, um, Good for you for standing yeah. your ground in that space and uh, taking that on and, and admitting to like, this is where I feel my passion is because I can help. Um, I think you're right. We need more education out there and we need to hold the professionals accountable to getting that education. Definitely. And and, and it's, a, I mean, I, I'm going to be true, you know, completely honest here. Victims of uh, domestic violence and coercive control, they are tough clients to have, um, you know, because quite often they're suffering from PTSD. They have unhealed trauma. Um, so when you're working with them, it can be hard to get them to make decisions, you know, because when you're going through the family law process, you're like you're making life altering, very important decisions that will affect you for years to come. And because the, of the PTSD and the the trauma and, you know, whatnot, and they haven't had a you know, chance to heal from it yet, it, it can be difficult for them to, to make these decisions. And so I can understand as well why att- attorneys might get frustrated with them. And, um, you know, that can be a challenge. And, you know, because the system, unfortunately, is a bit broken, um, you know, that's hard too, because you're, it, I think when people come into the system, they're expecting justice and fairness and those sorts of things. And it isn't always fair and it isn't always just. And if you have a lawyer who isn't as empathetic or compassionate about what the client is going through and, you know, because I think, as they say, clients expect it to be fair and expect it to be just. That's, you know, it's elite, it's the justice system. So, you know, lawyers need to be sensitive to that because we often, you know, are dealing with people who are very upset about what's going on and they may not have a therapist or they may not have a coach or they may not have a friend or family member who is supportive of them. So their lawyer is in a key role to, to show that support. Which is exactly why our process is set up to get them that financial knowledge so that they can, you know, we through not only what they want, but more more importantly, what they need. And for us, financial clarity, a lot of times is knowing what information may be missing, but knowing what information is there that we can focus on the knowns of the situation to say, what would the best outcome be on that? Because, you know, I think a lot of times where my frustration as a financial person comes in is where our clients say, or we're on a call with an attorney and they say, well, what do you want? Like, what do you want? And I just hung up with a client today and the attorney on Monday said, well, what do you want? Well, you want everything. Everybody wants everything. But it's what can you advocate for based on the data that we have that's verified, right? And I think when an attorney gets an informed client, that client, client, although could be difficult because of everything that you just mentioned, at least has like a grounding to what's there, what's missing, what rabbit hole do I want to go down or don't want to go down, and what will it look like post-divorce? So I, I always say you need to get your financial clarity first and then go to your attorney so they could be really good attorneys. Yeah, I think that's great advice because, you know, a lot of family law, it is about financial stuff. I mean, yes, there's also the parenting piece and there is you know, uh, fighting and and arguing that goes on about parenting schedules and decision making and that sort of thing. But uh, you know, a big piece of it is the financial, and um, I think that's why I think it's so important for clients to to work with financial uh, people with who have financial expertise as well, because um, you know, 
a lot of people are scared when they're going through divorce. They're, they're scared of the financial outcome. Are they going to be able to live? Are they going to be able to support their children? Are they going to be homeless? Um, you know, all of these things. And divorce is expensive. I mean, legal lawyers are expensive. I, that's, that's the reality as well. Um, and so I think having that financial clarity before you start it is really important. And, you know, a lot of people in this, even in 2024, there's a lot of women still who were not the breadwinner, not, you know, they were kind of in the dark more about the family finances and they are, they don't know where the money is or what money there is. And so, they're scared and nervous and, you know, getting that information for them is really helpful. That's so true, Leanne. And, you know, when people are in severe emotional distress, it's really hard for them to know, you know, where the, how to divide the emotions from the financial transaction. And so they easily then, when they're engaging with their attorney, they they really focus on the emotional trauma because that's what's front and center for them because they really never had financial knowledge. And so our experience is that when this happens and they engage in all of this emotional trauma with their attorney, you know, my spouse did this, they did that. A lot of money is spent in that space that goes nowhere. And then when it comes time to actually negotiate the division of the marital estate, The attorney needs another retainer and there's no more money left. And so then they're almost left to fend for themselves. And we find this to be a repetitive situation in so many um, families because then they come to us and they need help, but they're in a really tough situation by then. Yeah, no, that does happen a lot. And I mean, I see both sides of it because I'm also the attorney and, you know, you yeah. know, when someone retains me, when a client retains me, uh, I speak to them and they sign a retainer agreement that very, very clearly sets out that I am paid by the amount of time I spend on the file and that, you know, every call, every email, you know, all of those things they pay for. That's that's how I'm paid. That's how I provide food for my kids and pay my mortgage and, you know, those sorts of things. Everyone thinks, you know, attorneys are just rolling in, in money and that's not necessarily the case. And we know we have children and mortgages and, you know, are affected by high interest rates and all those things Mm -hmm. too, just like our clients are. And so I find it can be frustrating at times um, when I have a client who is burning through a lot of my time and we're having the same conversation over and over and over and they're not making a decision. Um, And, you know, I'm kind of then in a bit of a quandary because it's like, I feel they've used up my time. I could have been using that time on another client who's going to pay me. Um, you know, so it's, I don't think it's fair of the client to think that I shouldn't bill them for that time when the nature of our relationship was very clearly set out at the outset. Um, but on the other hand, it, it ties hard because I understand they're, they're traumatized and they're, they're using me to discuss sometimes more emotional issues than legal issues. And, um, you know, that's where it's helpful for them to, to work with some outside support systems, you know, as well to, to maybe redirect the emotion, you know, with that in that direction to talk to, to those people. But um, what you're talking about is a very common thing. I think, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of people in these high conflict relationships where there's coercive control and hostility, they, they do, they burn through, you know, their legal fees very quickly and they get that first bill and they realize, Hey, oh, like this, I really used up a lot of the lawyer's time here. And, and, mm-hmm. you know, this is a problem. Yeah. So yeah. when our, they come through our process, it's great because, you know, we're a flat fee, but we are able to say, okay, you, you do have some good legal questions as we're gathering this documentation, but wait until you have a couple of more and then go to your attorney with, okay, now it's time to go to your attorney. You have all these questions because we don't answer any legal questions, right? But we keep them in that space of moving forward, of getting prepared and getting that financial information. So when they come to you, they have their list of questions and then you don't get so frustrated because now you can actually do what you're trained to do, right? These are the questions we should be burning through your 
time with me because these are the legal questions I can address because you have the data for me to respond to. I can't respond to emotions. Same with when they tell us, give us a spreadsheet. Okay, well, your spreadsheet's beautifully done, but we need the documentation to verify it as financial people. We just can't take your word for it, although correct. We need the, the document actually to verify it before we even get it to you because you are going to make want to make sure that we verified and whatever we didn't verify, you're going to take the legal steps to verify, right? So exactly. that's why we get those, when we get those calls, like you just mentioned, okay, just burn through. Well, you can't really blame your attorney because you did call them crying every day about these things of which they can't do anything with. That's not what an attorney is there for to do. So if we could just change the way everyone goes through the process, you would be seeing the double the clients that you're seeing because you wouldn't get caught up in all of that. You would be coming in for the legal stuff. We would have them financially prepared and their coaches and their other team would help them emotionally. And families would, would experience a much better process than the archaic one that's set up now. I 100% agree. I, and, and I think that you know, one of the challenges I find sometimes with clients when, because when, when they're going through separation or divorce, they know they need a lawyer. Like, you know, that, that's the first, they, the, the first person they know they need on their team is generally, they know they need to get a lawyer. Um, and they know that that's probably going to be expensive. So they come through the door and they're, you know, they're nervous. They're, you know, their financial picture is about to really change because they're getting separated and divorced. They know they need to pay me X number of dollars or their, you know, what their, their own attorney, whatever amount of dollars. And when I say to them, you know, that there might be benefits to working with a coach or with, you know, a service like what you guys um, provide, often they're reluctant because they feel like they don't have you know, extra money for it. But, you know, it's the, the hard part is just trying to educate them that it's actually going to save them money in the long run. Because if they're, you know, dealing with you guys for financial stuff, they're dealing with a coach for the, you know, it's far cheaper to go and call your coach and process all the emotional stuff, or even your therapist, if you're working with a therapist, then, you know, it is with the, the lawyer. And I mean, I'm a, I like to think anyway, that I'm a very empathetic, compassionate type of person. So I bring that to my law practice. But at the end of the day, I, I'm the first to say I'm not a therapist. I'm not trained in therapy. I'm not, you know, I can help people a little bit, you know, dealing with their emotions, but it, it's not my forte. And so they're better off dealing with the right person, you know, for that aspect of things. And so I think it, it would be so much better if people, you know, came into the system with, with the team or, or the team is assembled, you know, at the get go and everyone does their role and the client pays each person for their role. And, and I think that the outcome would be, you know, a lot cheaper and probably a lot more satisfactory. This is what okay. we need to go to Congress about and have this conversation <laughs> because it should be mandated, right? Or go to the Crown yeah. office right there and um, <laughs> talk about this because if we could get everybody to do that again, I just think divorce would be um, a lot less volatile and a better outcome for the families financially, for sure. Yeah. For and sure. to your I mean, point, go ahead, Leanne. I was gonna say, and part of the problem too is like it, it's a minority of them, but there still are a minority of attorneys out there who have this old school approach where they do create more conflict. They do, you know, like, like when I have a file come through the door, a client come through the door, my thought is how can I help them to get a good outcome and settle this ideally? Um, whereas, you know, there's some lawyers that, and some clients, like some clients, you know, I want you to fight for me and be a pit bull and blah, blah, blah. And like, that's really not how family law should be approached. E even in high, con even in cases where there's abuse, it, it shouldn't be approached from the get go. How can we, uh, how can we fight and fight and fight? Because that is only going to benefit me financially, it, mm -hmm. you know, and that, that in family law, the, the initial approach right from the beginning should be, how can we resolve this so that everyone has a solution that they can live with? And then if that's not possible, okay, then, you know, we have, that's where you look at litigation and things, but there's still, as you say, there are that small group of lawyers out there who I think do make things worse. And that's part of the problem as well. And I think historically, that's the way it's, it always was, and it's progressed into more opportunities for clients, but yet 
the industry hasn't changed the dialogue about it um, as much as that needs to be done. You know, often we'll talk with our clients and they will, you know, they're still in the space of divorce means I'm I'm going to get uh, re revenge of sorts on my spouse, right? And so the attorney is dealing with that on a daily basis. And I, you know, I often find myself saying to our clients, you know, at the end of the day, you are the client. So your attorney has to respond to what you're coming to the table with. So when you're changing your mind every day and every day you want something different, they can't just turn a blind eye to that. You are the client. So if you as a client can come to the table informed, knowing what you need your attorney to do for you and knowing what the impact is of that decision with their guidance, that really gets you farther down the road. And then to your point, the behavior of this other spouse is dealt with in a way that, you know, maybe they do need protection from the court, but it's very different from the actual divorce transaction. And I think a lot of people have trouble coming to terms with that. Yeah, I, I agree. I think a lot of people are looking for the system as well to validate them and their feelings. And it's not, it doesn't, it's, it's not about that. It's not about this person's a hundred percent right. And this person's a hundred percent wrong. And let's school this person for their bad behavior. Um, it, it, it's not going to do that. If, you know, people needing validation of their feelings, that's not, that's got to come from outside the, the, the family law system. I mean, I can, as a lawyer, I can validate it, but that's just, you know, because I find sometimes when clients get a, you know, a letter from the opposing counsel that's upsetting or accusing them of different things that are, they say, you know, it's just complete lies and false. Like, you know, I always have to remind them, like, just because the other lawyers put this in a letter, it doesn't make it true. Um, and it doesn't mean that anyone believes this, um, you know, and, and it, again, it just comes down to the, the emotional regulation that, you know, a lot of people don't have and they need to, to learn through the process. If you had to take an educated guess, and today, after today, we can change the law everywhere that people had to be financially prepared. They had to have a therapist or a coach to handle their emotions. They needed to use their really good attorney. Um, how many hours would you save off your time if they had that team? I don't know. I mean, it's really hard to say. I mean, I think significant because, you know, in that type of situation, then something shouldn't have to go to court. And, you know, that's where, as soon as you have to go to court, that's where things really spiral. But there's a lot of, you know, I, I find a lot of the letter writing is a waste of time. Like, you know, you have somebody come through the door and they don't want to go to court. And you spend all this time writing letters back and forth with the other side, only to find that you've spent five thousand dollars, you know, and six months later, and nothing has really progressed. And so, I find as a lawyer, I'm always very cognizant of trying to avoid that type of situation for a client, because I think that's worse than going to court and at least having some progress, even if it was expensive. Um, but yeah, I think if people, you know, had a team in place right from the beginning. Um, you know, it would save them, it, it, you know, enormous amount in legal fees. I, I, I can't put a, like a number of hours on it because each file is just so specific, but it, it definitely would. Yeah. That's a good point you bring up too, about those letters going back and forth to go nowhere. It's, yeah. That's the emotional part, right? Somebody wants to get something out there and somebody wants to respond with, like you just said, doesn't mean it's true what they responded with, nor does anyone believe what they said, but now you just paid for that. Yeah, well, well, just as an example, I had a situation last week where the client um, had the daughter with him and she was having some digestive issues and it was coming out in her bowel movement and he took a photo of her bowel movement and sent it to us. And my my law clerk was saying, do we need to send this photo to the other lawyer? And I said, no, like just let her know that the child you know, was having some digestive issues and he was concerned about what she might have eaten or whatever earlier in the day when she was with the other parent. And my clerk sent that message to the, the other lawyer, but she mentioned in there that there was a photo if she wanted to see it. I, I wouldn't have necessarily added that part, but she put it in and the other lawyer wanted to see the photo. And so I was just like, this is ridiculous. Like we're all looking at this photo of a bowel movement and our clients are paying us 
you know, paying their lawyers on each side to be looking at this stupid photo that's really not necessary. Um, but like, that's the type of stuff, unfortunately, that happens. Oh, but gosh. if they have the right professionals, you know, maybe they could have gone to their their coach or something with that rather than their lawyer and said, do I need to send this to my lawyer? Is it something you know, that they, that's going to need to be part of everything. That's a great example. That, yeah. And the thousands of dollars that have to be used to deal with that situation, because as an attorney, you have to do something with that information. You can't just let it lie in a file, right? Yeah. And, like I can't just yeah. say, oh, you know, or I have to read it, right? Like I have to read yeah. the email comes in from the client with a photo. So I have to read it and look at it. And so, you know, right there, you know, it was probably $50 minimum, you know, to, to have me just do that part of it, let, let alone anything else with it. And so that's where people, you know, clients, the more educated and mindful they can be about what they're using their lawyer for, you know, it is it, helpful to save them the money. Oh my gosh. That is just so true. And, you know, it's really changing the way people who are divorcing think about it because they know they need an attorney. That's historically the foundational professional you need for a divorce. However, changing the dialogue to say, instead of spending money on copying text messages and you know photos and things like that, that money could be much better spent on financial clarity, on managing your emotions, and being able to successfully navigate those emotional challenges so that when you're using your attorney, obviously you're getting the best outcome um, available. Because sometimes I think those things are used as a distraction from the real issues on the table. We see that a lot too, just you know, when there's some really big financial issues on the table and something like that will come through to throw everybody off because you know, your children are the closest to your heart. Another thing we see, Leanne, is when um, you have a one spouse is coercive and the other one has not been the financial manager and they start negotiating way before that person knows the financial impact of those decisions. But their relationship has been that model their entire marriage. And so it's really hard for them to convert into, um, I guess, a balance of discussion so that they can have really good decisions. We find that so often in these types of relationships. I agree with that a lot. I have a lot of people come through the door where their spouse, first off, has been telling them, oh, don't get a lawyer. We don't need to get lawyers involved. They're just going to make all that, take all our money. And, you know, they're trying to push them into some sort of agreement that they're kind of quasi already agreeing to, which is going to have no enforceability down the road, like those kitchen table type agreements they, they're not, they're not going to stand the test of time, because as soon as somebody wants to challenge it, it's going to be found invalid, and it's not going to legally stand up, it needs, you know, so I, I have to really educate people that it has to be done properly. And that unfortunately, you, you need to spend the money on lawyers. Um, but they, you know, they, I find often people who are controlling, they want to control the process. So they don't want their partner to get a lawyer who's going to advocate for them and perhaps say something different than what the coercive partner is telling them and wanting them to ha have happen. And um, it, you know, it can be very hard because, you know, when someone comes through the door as well, like, you know, maybe they follow me on social media, so they feel like they kind of know me, but they don't really know me. And I have to build trust with them. And so, you know, they've got this lawyer who they know they have to pay, you know, whatever the hourly rate is, it's a lot of money to who they don't really know. And they're trying to decide, can I trust them? They've got their family and friends in their ear putting their two cents into everything. And then they've got this spouse who, you know, has been controlling them for, you know, however many years, and they're trying to break out from that control. But that's, you know, hard too. they they've let that person let isn't the right word, but they've been controlled by that person for a long period of time. And so standing up to them or fighting against what they're saying is challenging too. So it's a really tough situation for somebody to be in. 
which is, again, I'm going to go back to the financial preparedness, you know? So if you have that same woman that you just spoke about who has all of those people and yeah, she thinks she knows you, but she doesn't, but she likes you because she's seen you on your social media or whatever, a friend went to you. But when, they, when she comes to you and she has some kind of financial knowledge, if not all the information, but she has a little bit of a um, different standpoint because she has some kind of knowing that we've provided for her. Now she gets, you get to be the smart attorney you are because you're actually looking at data instead of looking at her emotions and what everybody is telling her and then saying how you can apply that data to the law to give her some kind of hope for her future, not based on just what you're saying. But I would go to you a hundred times over if you looked at the complexities of my case based on data and actually told me how you can advocate for me legally then that to me is the best trust building exercise um, because you could tell me all day long that you're going to give me a shoulder to cry on, but that's not getting me what I want at the end of the day, right? It's getting me through the next few months. I want to know that you're an attorney that handles the complexity of my case and that you'll give me the confidence I need to decide what I want and need for my future. To me, again, we're going back to the same, let's change the way people go through this process. No, absolutely. And, you know, the amount of money I think that people waste, like I know when we're preparing financial statements and financial disclosure and, it, you know, the, the amount of time where, you know, we're, we're asking for something and they're saying we've already sent it and they, we wouldn't be asking if they already sent it. Like, it, you know, but they sent the 2017 notice of assessment and we're asking for the 2019 notice of assessment. Like they don't, you know, because it's like doing your taxes. I find, you know, most people hate this kind of stuff, but, you know, so most clients who, even the ones who are more financially savvy, it's just gen generally like, providing all your financial disclosure and completing a financial statement, like very few people enjoy that sort of thing. So it's like, it's pulling teeth with people. And so they waste a lot of money, I think with the law firm having, you know, us doing it. Um, I mean, in, in my firm, like clerk tends to work with them, you know, I oversee it and I have to review it. And if there's a particular issue, I get involved, but you know, otherwise she helps them prepare it and that helps keep the cost down somewhat but a lot of people as they say it can be a big time waster and, and it can be expense when we're they're not co like providing what we're asking them for and it's taking longer than it needs to and i think you know again working with some someone like you guys i think it would be faster and more efficient and i'm sure cheaper for them as well yeah, and so you know true. what? They alleviate some mistakes that are made because we do that form for them, a draft version, and then we would get on with you to see how you like your data in there. Um, so it's specific to that. But you know, there have been so many cases where people have done this on their own, and an attorneys who have filed them, and now they say it's more when they go to a different attorney who can handle the complexities of their case. They say, well, it's really hard to undo what you already filed with the court. So we, that's our first step with our clients, actually, um, which we have found to be life-changing for so many people. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, financial disclosure is like, it's like one of the absolute most important parts of separation and divorce. You know, people do focus on the emotions and the children, and obviously children are very important, but most of the, the issues are financial and are stemming from those financial statements and the financial disclosure. So it's, it's really important that, it, and if you do it incorrectly or you miss things, because it's a sworn statement, I miss, it's, it's a sworn statement here in Ontario. I'm assuming that's the case, mm -hmm. you know, in, it, you know, in the U S as well. Um, you know, you're, that client is accountable if, you know, they miss something or something changed on a subsequent financial statement. And you don't want to put someone in that type of situation either, where they, the initial statement was inaccurate or missing something. And then they've got an opposing counsel, you know, accusing them of being misleading or something because they didn't understand properly that something had to be there. So we have a lot of Canadian clients, but how do we get you to the States? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I'd like That's to live so in true. warm climates. So. <laughs> if you can there handle you my immigration situation, <laughs> I'd be happy to go live in the yeah. southern U.S. and be warm all year round. <laughs> well, you're That's totally so welcome. True. And we totally will have a lot of clients for you if you do that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm just going to add there that, you know, when you're a victim of domestic violence or you haven't been the financial 
manager, you, you know, your spouse, you're under severe coercive control. Filling out an income and expense is daunting in and of itself. And that's just the role I do. And then they also do their assets and debts with the divorce financial specialist. But, you know, they more often than not, when I'm first meeting <clears throat> with a client, they just want to write down a number and not think about it. And so going through that process and learning and knowing it and becoming empowered with it, like this is what you have. This is what you've lived on. This may be how you've reduced your lifestyle, or this is what is available to you. This is how your family spends money. It in the end is empowering and it, but it does take the step-by-step of becoming engaged with how your family spends money. And so sometimes that whole step gets missed when you're just quickly jotting down numbers for your attorney or your clerk, you know, your paralegal, and um, hoping they don't ask you about it again. (laughs) So, you know, to that point, um, going through it step by step and owning the information so that you know how to talk about it if you're challenged with it is very important. Yeah, I think that's really important because I think sometimes what happens too with law firms is there's this rush to get it done. And the so the client doesn't necessarily really understand the numbers. Like they're giving information to the lawyer or the clerk and, and the lawyer or clerk is putting them into the financial statement and arranging the disclosure. And then it's being sworn with the client and you kind of go, you go through it when they swear it. But they aren't necessarily understanding where the numbers are coming from, even though they provide it the statements that have the numbers. And so then again, when they're questioned about it down the road, they don't really understand it and it's not empowering. And they feel, you know, unfortunately, I think a lot of times people feel silly or stupid or, you know, whatever it might be when they have to ask questions, which of course is should not be the case. And I always say, you know, to clients of lawyers that like you are the client, like you don't be intimidated by your lawyer and don't be afraid to ask your lawyer a question because you're the one in charge. You're the client. They they should be, you know, in some level catering, catering isn't the right word, but they should be servicing you. Um, so you shouldn't be afraid to ask questions, but I know a lot of people, you know, sometimes do you feel intimidated or like they're, they're going to look stupid or it's a, a dumb question or, or whatnot. And that's something you need to, I find I need to always make clear, like there's no, there's no such thing. Let's replay that and end on that. Uh, that is so true. And I, you know, we can say it, but when a lawyer says it, says it to them, it's much different, but you're so right on that. And and then again, it's being prepared so that you can help direct your situation. Love that. Absolutely. This has been great. Leanne, how can our listeners find you and learn more about you? Uh, the best place to find me is my website, which is www.townsinfamilylaw.ca. And that has all my contact information there, as well as my social media links. So uh, that's the best place. Perfect. Well, this concludes our discussion, the struggle of dealing with a course of spouse in the legal system. Thank you so much for a fantastic conversation. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.